Taranis is one of the best known of the Gaulish deities. This is only fitting since he is the deity we know the most about. His name has an obvious etymology. There are inscriptions to him. He's mentioned in a Roman text and scolio or glosses to that text. There is a Roman deity consistently associated with him. There are large numbers of representations of him. We have representation of a ritual directed towards him. We have an idea of one time of the year at which he was worshipped, and we have the outlines of one of his myths. This is a remarkable amount of information to have about a Gaulish deity. There are actually two god forms that have been combined by many under the name Tyrannus. Some reputable scholars, on the other hand, such as Jan de Vries and Miranda Green, believe them to be two distinct deities. I myself will argue that they are a single one. The first is the one who appears in written sources as Tyrannus. We have nine inscriptions to him. As you can see, like so many of the Gaulish gods, the name of Tyrannus is found in a number of forms. Some of these may represent local variations, while others are clearly a result of inscribers adapting the Roman alphabet to a Gaulish name, but doing so inconsistently. The one that has become standard is Tyrannus. This is the spelling in one of the inscriptions, but the reason it has become standard is that it's found in a classical source, Pharsalia, by the first century poet Lucan, along with two scolia from the fourth and fifth centuries. One scolium on Lucan's passage identifies him with the Roman god Jupiter and says that he's a master of war and one of the heavenly gods, while another says he's Dispater. We are also told that people were sacrificed to him by being burned in a wooden trough. That Tyrannus is included in a list with Estus, Toitates, and Pharsalia has had influence beyond the spelling of the name. First, it's contributed to speculations about Gaulish human sacrifice, especially whether it was performed in different ways for different deities. Second, there have been attempts to correlate the nature of each deity with their assigned method of sacrifice. What does it mean, for instance, that victims sacrificed to Tyrannus were killed by being burned in wooden troughs? Finally, and most insidiously, it made these deities look like some sort of mini pantheon as gods that were connected with each other, dividing up the divine reality between them. At its weakest, this theory has led to things like assigning each of them to each of the Dumazilian functions of priest, warrior, and producer. At its strongest, there have been attempts to classify all other Gaulish male divinities as some form of one of these. I consider it best, though, to see the group as having been found by, by serendipity. Perhaps they were popular in the area where Lucan was writing, or perhaps he himself found them particularly interesting. There are enough Gaulish gods that maybe he couldn't list all the ones he knew, so he just gave three examples. Maybe he wanted to make a point about how barbaric the Gauls were by talking about how they practiced human sacrifice, and these were the only three he knew about who received human offerings. Or maybe it wasn't Lucan himself. Maybe he relied on a local informant who had one of these reasons. Maybe he even relied on three separate informants, each of whom was dedicated to one of the gods, with the list being put together not by a Gaul, but by the Roman Lucan. In short, we can't assign any significance to the fact that these particular deities are found together on a list. The meaning of the name is clear. To the proto-Celtic Tarn has been added a personal ending. Tarnus is therefore literally thunder. All the rest of the evidence supports it. As we see in the inscriptions, the identification with Jupiter is consistent. His name is linked with Jupiter both as Job and as IOM, which stands for Jupiter Optimus Maximus, Jupiter Best and Greatest. This makes sense since Jupiter is, among other things, a god of lightning and thunder. None of these inscriptions is accompanied by an image. What we can learn about him from them is that a god called Thunder existed, that he was connected with or identified with Jupiter by the Romans or by the Gauls under the Romans, and that he was worshipped over a widespread area from Britain to Dalmatia. The second god form is one that exists only in images, with no Celtic identifying name. Because he is shown with a wheel, he has been called the Wheel God. His artifacts fall into three categories. First is what might be called miscellaneous images. These consist of a variety of somewhat idiosyncratic images. This is the most famous image and the one that you'll find the most often if you do a Google search for Tyrannus. Coming from saint Didier, it depicts a bearded mature man with a thunderbolt in his raised right hand as if he is prepared to throw it and his left hand grasping a wheel. Around his right arm is a ring with S shapes that Green has reasonably identified as extra thunderbolts making his ring an ammunition cache. The appearance of the god and the thunderbolt together identify him as Jupiter who has been conflated with the wheel god. Likely to be connected as a pot from Silchester, with alternating wheels and S-shapes, and a wheel from Grand Jolie, onto which S-shapes have been soldered. This image from Segre is interesting, because although the eagle identifies this wheel god with Jupiter, he wasn't customarily depicted in armor. Remember, though, that one of the Baron Scolius called Tyrannus the master of war. 
In this image, a bearded man, presumably a god, carries a pole in his right hand, his throwing hand, at the top of which a wheel is affixed. In his left is a rod, likely a scepter, which identifies him with Jupiter, an identification which is supported by his beard. On another side of the altar is a thunderbolt. Here, from the Musée de Grey, we have again a bearded man. This time the wheel appears to be stuck to the side of his head, but it was actually held in his upraised right arm like the thunderbolts and other statues. Here we have the unusual detail of a cornucopia in one hand, carried by a god from Netherby in Cumbria. There is a wheel over an altar to his right. The cornucopia appears again with a wheel god from Ney, who holds two of them. This mold from Colchester is packed with symbolism, if only we could understand it. A man who is in armor, like in the image from Sigare, is accompanied by a wheel. In his left hand, he holds a crooked club. Although a club is the standard identifying feature of Hercules, that god never wears armor, and his club is never crooked like this. Instead of being just a club, then, I suspect that it is meant to represent a lightning bolt. It's odd that the warrior is carrying the club in his left hand, but as we have seen from the other images, the right side is the most common one for the wheel, so the importance of that may have been the deciding factor. Also from Britain, from Willingham Fen in Cambridgeshire, is this scepter with, among other things, a three-horned bull, an eagle over a wheel, and a man holding either a thunderbolt or a club, with one foot on another figure. In the Rhineland Faults, there are eagles accompanying gods on thrones carved with wheels. The eagle and throne identify these gods with Jupiter. There are also a number of small statues from the Allier district of wheel gods with thunderbolts. Some of them hold their hands over a smaller figure. This may represent an enemy, but there is a far more interesting possibility which will come up later. A statue of a wheel god from Landosy la Ville is inscribed to IOM et N A V G, that is, to Jupiter greatest and best and the Newman or spirit of the emperor. Here is a pre Roman depiction from the justly famous Gundestrup cauldron which came from the upper Balkans. There were no connections with Jupiter here, of course, but as we shall see, the wheel, the smaller man holding it, and the ram headed snake at the bottom are important. An even earlier wheel god comes from Valcamonica in northeastern Italy, a region not far from where the Gundestrup cauldron was made, and from the images in which the cauldron got much of its symbolism. It is a carving in a rock which shows an armed man who has a wheel for a head. The second category is that of wheels that aren't accompanied by human figures. I've already mentioned the pot from Silchester with alternating wheels and the S-shapes, and the wheel from Grangely with its S-shapes. There's also this altar from Gloucestershire, on its top is a carving of a wheel, and a ram-headed snake curls up its side. At Lansag, we find a wheel with two thunderbolts, and an, on an altar from Kuhn is an inscription to Jupiter over a wheel. Not representing or presenting a god, but rather likely serving as offerings to him, are small wheels which are found at a variety of sites. They are usually found as groups and tell us of places where the wheel god was worshipped, either without an image or with one that has disappeared over time. The third form in which the wheel god appears is the Jupiter columns, of which there are at least 150. They are concentrated in the Rhine region, but they are also found in other parts of Gaul and as far away as Brittany. One has even been found in Budapest. They are found mostly outside cities, at villas besides rivers, or in cemeteries. Jupiter columns range from at least 4 to 9 meters high. They rise from a 4 or 8 sided base on which are either planetary gods or Roman deities, usually Juno, Minerva, Hercules, and Minerva. The column itself is often carved with leaves, indicating that it is to be thought of as a tree. There are three varieties of Jupiter columns. First, we have ones which have a standing deity which looks like the individual statues we have already seen. The second kind have seated gods, who are represented as unremarkable forms of Jupiter. The third is the most interesting, and is generally what is thought about when the term Jupiter column is used. These depict a riding god. His right arm is raised and apparently originally held a thunderbolt. His horse is trampling over one or more monstrous images that are part human and part snake. The question arises of what this form of the wheel god represents. I think it likely that he is raised on a column to indicate that he is a celestial deity, although it is possible that it was meant to show that he was a preeminent god. That he was meant to be Jupiter is clear from a number of things. First, Jupiter isn't present in the group of the other deities on the basis of the column. Secondly, Maximus of Tyre tells us that the Gauls worship Zeus in the form of an oak tree, and the pillars were designed to look like trees. Third, the deity on top of them likely held a thunderbolt. Fourth, there is often a wheel, either held as a shield or laid against the side of the god or his horse, and as we have seen, we know from other representations that the wheel god was associated with Jupiter. 
There is another reason why the wheel god is to be identified with Jupiter, but before talking about it, we need to talk about wheels and the wheel god in general, since if we can figure out what the wheel means, we're likely to be able to say what kind of deity the wheel god is. The first thing to do is to deal with speculations based on the number of spokes in the wheel. Some have suggested that they're meant to correspond with seasonal festivals. That this can't be true is shown by the extreme variability in the number of spokes. We have wheels with four spokes, five spokes, six, eight, nine, and ten. Since there's only half a wheel on the Gundestrip cauldron panel, it might be meant to show a 16-spoke wheel. There's even an altar with an eight-spoked wheel on one side and a nine-spoked on another. A more important theory about the wheel is that it's solar. Wheels or disks are connected with suns in a number of cultures. Jan de Vries and Miranda Green are strong advocates of this theory, which would make the wheel god a solar deity. The arguments in its favor are, one, that the rider god is lifted up on pillars could indicate that he is a celestial deity. Two, his identification with Jupiter could indicate the same thing. Three, the mosaic from saint Ramon Angal, which shows a ritual to the wheel god at the beginning of summer and possibly in June, the month of the summer solstice. Four, the wheel god is a rider and horses are often connected with the sun. And five, there is, of course, a possible connection between wheels and the sun. I believe that all of these can be answered in the negative. To begin with, there are more ways to be celestial than to be a sun god. A weather god or god of the stars are two possibilities. Second, Jupiter wasn't a solar deity. When he is connected with the natural world, it's with lightning and thunder, not the sun. On the mosaic, although the wheel god is connected with June, it's only as a marker of the beginning of summer. There are other reasons to connect a deity with summer than through the solar occasion of midsummer. It's the season for growth, for instance. It's also the season of thunderstorms, which can supply crops with much needed water or flatten them in a deluge. Thunderstorms are also accompanied by lightning, which has its own destructive properties. A ritual at the beginning of summer could therefore be intended to invoke the beneficent powers of the storm, banish the negative ones, or both. That the wheel god is a rider could be due to the importance of the horse in Celtic society. In Ireland and Wales, the horse was a symbol of kingship, and this could be the case here. Finally, there is a solar wheel argument. Here, Green and De Vries are imposing the identification of wheels and the sun on Gaulish iconography rather than drawing the wheel's meaning out of it. Like all symbols, even when we can say that one meaning might be more common than another, we are not justified in applying that meaning to every case. We have to ask, for instance, whether we ever find a wheel in Gaul in a clearly solar context. As far as I know, the answer is that we don't. There aren't Gaulish wheels associated with images of Saul or even with Apollo. What we find instead are wheels associated with images of Jupiter, who may have been celestial but was associated with the sun only in an etymology unknown to the Romans and certainly not apparent to the Gauls. An identification of the Gaulish wheel god as solar requires that we assume the Gauls took a sun god, for whom there is no other evidence, and identified him with a Roman god who has no solar characteristics, and that they indicated this identification through the thunderbolt. This seems absurd to me. If we put aside the idea of the wheel being solar for a minute, we can look at the rest of this god's imagery and decide whether it supports his identity as a storm god. First, the wheel god may be intended by the rosette on a circle on the altar from Chester, which is inscribed to Tanaris. Then there is his identification with Jupiter. Although, like all Roman gods, Jupiter was more complex than just being a god of X, a particular side of him is emphasized in the Gaulish images. Although his throne, scepter, and eagle do sometimes show up, it is his thunderbolt that is most often found. Emphasizing the importance of this role is the ring with S-shapes on it that even Green identifies as extra thunderbolts, an odd thing for a solar god to be carrying. Third, the thunderbolt is the symbol most often found with wheels, even though the god himself is not depicted. Just as the wheel is shorthand for the wheel god, the thunderbolt is shorthand for Jupiter when he is connected with the wheel. Next, at Vauvert near Nîmes, there is an altar with a wheel and two thunderbolts, with the inscription Conditum. This is the second half of the phrase Fulgur Conditum, which the Romans inscribed on altars they set up on spots where lightning had struck. Fifth, as I explained earlier, the mosaic from saint roman en Gaul can be explained in terms of thunderstorms. Sixth, the mold from Colchester shows the wheel god with a crooked club that could be meant to depict a lightning bolt. Seven, thunder is often imagined as the rolling of a wheel or the passage of a wagon in European folklore. Under this interpretation, the wheel of this god is rolling thunder. Note that the wheel god often has both a wheel and a thunderbolt, which could therefore be depicting him as being armed with lightning and thunder. And finally, there is the myth that I have teased you with already, one that is clearly connected with the wheel god. This is the Indo-European myth of the dragon slaying. In this myth, a hero god, usually connected with lightning and thunder, and with combat, 
kills a serpentine figure, usually in monstrous form, using an aerial weapon. He is sometimes helped by a mortal. The classic example of this is the Vedic Indra and a num variety of serpentine monsters such as Vertra. Closer to Gaul is Thor, who fights the Midgard serpent. There is also Heracles, who kills the multi-headed serpentine hydra with arrows, with the help of the mortal Aeolus. A probable early Celtic version of this myth is on the Gundestrup cauldron. Here we have a deity armed with a wheel, supported by a smaller, probably human figure. At the base of the panel is the serpent, made monstrous by the ram's head. He may already be dead, or may be shown as coming from underneath the earth. That there is only half a wheel may be because it would have been difficult for the sil silversmith to make a full one in the format of the panel, or in order to make it both a wheel and a thunderbolt. If we turn to more recent images, we find a clear parallel in the Jupiter columns. Jupiter is attacking one or more partially serpentine figures with a lightning bolt. This is almost certainly a representation of the Titanomachy, a myth in which Jupiter b battles the anti-cultural Titans. That this is a Celticized version of the myth is shown by Jupiter being on horseback. The Roman Jupiter was no rider, rider being seen as not suitable for a god as supreme as him. The Gauls, on the other hand, were involved with horses to the extent of being primary members of Roman cavalry. If we look at the imagery of the Gaulish wheel god, then, we get a god who is connected with thunder and lightning, not the sun. But is he Tyrannus? In other words, would ancient Gauls, if asked to identify a depiction of a wheel-bearing god, say, that's Tyrannus? I believe he would, based on four things. First, based on its etymology, it would certainly be an appropriate name for him. Tyrannus, after all, is cognate with the name of the snake-fighting Thor. Second, the distribution of inscriptions to Tyrannus overlaps that of depictions of the wheel god. It beggars belief to say that there have been two thunder gods in the same area. Third, both Tyrannus and the wheel are associated with Jupiter. Finally, we have not only two representations of a wheel god in armor, but this helmet, where a warrior has no doubt meant to invoke the power of the wheel god by wearing that deity's attribute. This lines up nicely with the statements of one of the scolias on Lucan, that not only is Tyrannus to be identified with Jupiter, but he was a master of war. In summary, then, we can say a lot about Tyrannus. We know the meaning of his name, that he was widely worshipped, that he was identified with Jupiter, that he was the bearer of the thunderbolt, that he had a wheel for a symbol, and that wheels, libations, and perhaps grain were offered to him. We may have a time of the year or a season associated with him, and most precious of all, we have the outline of one of his myths. When it comes to what we know about Tyrannus, then, we are truly blessed, if only we knew as much about the other deities of Gaul.